In this presentation, we will look at some items or events that are in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19. I'd encourage you to read those so you'll know the details in the storyline as you watch this presentation. So with that, let's first take a look at Matthew 27, 15 through 23, and this person called Barabbas. Verse 15, Now at the feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. 16, And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom shall ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Verse 18, For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Verse 19, When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent it to him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Verse 20, But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Verse 21, The governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. 22, Pilate said unto them, What shall I then do with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. Verse 23, And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. There is an interesting thing that happens in these verses that I've just read, if you understand that in Aramaic, the name Barabbas means son of the father. Just like Jesus Christ was son of the father. Many scholars believe that his first name was also Jesus. So Jesus Barabbas. So he would have been Jesus, son of the Father. And Jesus the Christ also called himself the son of the Father. Isn't it interesting that unfortunately they chose the wrong son of the Father. Here are two men whose names are Jesus, son of the Father. And they pick the one who was a murderer instead of the Christ. Matthew 27, verse 24, Pilate declares his innocence. In 24 it says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult, tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Now, this is an interesting thing because it, let, let's read out of Deuteronomy chapter 21, 1 through 9, where it talks about not knowing who killed a person and what they did under the law of Moses. It seems like Pilate is following one of their own commandments. Deuteronomy 21, 1 through 9 says, verse 1, If one be found slain in the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known unto, known who hath slain him, then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of the city, shall take an heifer, which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn the yoke. And the elders of the city shall bring him down the heifer into a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. And the priests and the sons of Levi shall come near, for them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him, and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their words shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. 
and all the elders of the city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. Then And then shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood unto thy people of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. And so thou and so shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of God. Isn't that interesting? This makes you wonder if Pilate was familiar with this part of the law of Moses. And he's performing the act that shows innocence of the blood of somebody. This passage treats the case of undetected homicide. Murder pollutes the land and must be ex expiated. When the murder cannot be discovered, the responsibility of making atonement rests with the city nearest to the scene of the crime. For rough valley, read valley with running water, and or strike off the heifer's neck, read break the heifer's neck. Eared means plowed, as in Exodus 34:21. The proper satisfaction for the crime of murder would be the death of the murderer. But as he cannot be discovered, the heifer takes his place. The unworked heifer and the untilled lamb probably suggest complete servience from the human life and symbolizes the unnaturalness of the crime of murder. The washing of the hands is a protestation of innocence. The elders, in the name of all the citizens, take an oath of purgation. And so, it's interesting that Pilate performs, it seems like, this part of the law of Moses saying, this man is innocent, I find nothing wrong with him, and I wash my hands and show I am innocent. Of this deed. Then answered, this is back now in Matthew, then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and our children. Boy, what a hasty declaration to make in such circumstances, as Christ's blood will be held upon the Jewish people and their descendants, just as they said, Let it be. Let's go to Matthew 27, 29 through 44. If thou be the Son of God. Starting with verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. I'm sorry, this should be Matthew 27, 39 through 44. Verse 40. And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. 41. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and the elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. 43. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Verse 44. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. So here we are with Christ, already great amount of loss of blood from Gethsemane, and then from being scourged and whipped, and now in this vulnerable state, they come and mock him and say, if you're the Son of God. Elder Tad R. Callister, a former member of the Quorum of Seventy, said this concerning this episode. Christ was walking the fine line that separates death from life, consciousness from unconsciousness. From Satan's perspective, the time of vulnerability was here. No wonder Satan came at such a propitious moment, spewing forth his insidious temptation 
through the lips of his mortal pawns. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. The Savior body withered in pain, in pure spotless spirit, revolted in violent reaction to sin and its consequences that Satan came at such a moment on the cross is indicate, indicative that the Savior was reaching the threshold of his pain, the climax of his mission. This was Satan's last chance, his final desperate hope to frustrate and the redemptive plan. It was now or never. There was no angel to strengthen the Holy One, no sustaining influence of the Father. Surely Satan liked the odds. This was the showdown. Satan accompanied, perhaps by his legions of nefarious forces, against the Savior and all his compelling loneliness. The Savior in his weakened, almost lifeless condition, battling a universal accumulation of suffering, Satan's timing was impeccable. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Christ, very vulnerable this time, having suffered so much pain already and lost of so much blood, his physical strength must have been spent. And so Satan put it into the hearts of the wicked, tempting him, if thou be the Son of God, show us and we'll believe you. But even in that heightened pain, Christ stays true to his covenants and finishes his preparations unto men. Matthew 27, 50 through 51, the veil of the temple. Verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. You need to understand that the veil of the temple separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Only the high priest was allowed to enter past the veil of the temple into the holy of holies, which symbolized entering into the presence of Christ, where the ark of the covenant with its mercy seat which symbolized Christ, was located and only on the Day of Atonement. So only the high priest once a year was ever permitted to enter into the Holy of Holies, which was symbolic of entering into God's presence. That the veil of the temple was now rent or removed from, or removed now that the Savior has completed the atonement suggests that now through the atonement of Christ and upon the conditions of repentance, all were enabled to enter into the presence of God through the atonement of Jesus Christ. So it wasn't just the high priest now. Because of the atonement, we can all return and enter into the Holy of Holies, so to speak, through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 15, verse 25, and then 33 to 35, the crucifixion and the morning and evening sacrifices in the temple. You need to understand that according to the law of Moses, every morning, every evening, a lamb was offered as sacrifice. And the people seeing the smoke rising the sacrifice would be reminded of the great sacrifice of the Savior who was to come. They performed it every morning, so the first thing you saw in the morning, your mind was focused on Christ, and then in the evening, before thou retired, thy mind again was focused on Christ. Starting with verse 25, it says, And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. The third hour was around 9 a.m., this would be about the same time that the priests in the temple were offering the morning sacrifice of a lamb that represented the offering of the Savior as the Lamb of God. So Christ is being put up on the cross probably at the same time that they are offering up this lamb, which symbolized this very moment. Verse 33, And when the sixth hour was come, 
There was darkness over the whole face until the ninth hour. So the sixth hour would be around noon. 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Brother Talmadge and Elder McConkie both tell us that on the cross, the suffering of Gethsemane returned, and Christ was not expecting that. And that's why he yells out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Meaning, what? I have to suffer the pains of the Garden of Gethsemane again? The ninth hour would then be around 3 p.m., around the same time that the priests in the temple were offering the evening sacrifice of a lamb that represented the sacrifice of the Savior to come. Isn't that incredible? They're performing this ordinance which pointed to the death of Christ. And here they are performing this ordinance at the time that Christ is literally going through the pain and suffering and death. And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone let us see whether Elias comes to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Obviously, the ordinance that was performed in the temple of the evening and morning sacrifice, the symbolism of it, and the truth and the gospel doctrine that was teaching that Christ would be killed, was lost to them. I just find it fascinating that the time that they're doing these two sacrifices is the exact same time Christ is being offered up as the Lamb of God. The ordinance just became something they did. They had lost the meaning. They had lost what it pointed to. We could be in the same dilemma if we just go and partake of the sacrament and give no thought for what's going on. It just becomes something we do and we could lose its meaning just as the Jews had lost the meaning of the evening and morning sacrifice. The morning and evening sacrifice of a lamb each day was to help Israel think of Christ and his future offering at the beginning of the day and the evening sacrifice to help them remember Christ at the close of the day thus help them to always remember him and the sacrifice he would perform on behalf of mankind. That the Savior is being crucified and dies at the same time the morning and evening sacrifices are being performed shows how, shows how much Israel had lost the true meaning of the ordinance and what it pointed to. They should have all thought of that ordinance and realized, oh, that's the Lamb of God and he will be suffered and he will be offered up as a sacrifice. But they had lost the meaning, the symbolism. Hopefully we do not make the same mistake with our ordinances and the symbolism. Mark 15, 34, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Elder James E. Talmadge taught, At the ninth hour, or about three in the afternoon, a loud voice, surpass, surpassing the most anguished cry of physical suffering, issued from the central cross, rendering the dreadful darkness. It was the voice of Christ, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What mind of man can fathom the sacrifice of that awful cry? I'm sorry, the significance of that awful cry. It seems that in addition to the fearful suffering incident to crucifixion, the agony of Gethsemane had returned, intensified beyond human power to endure, in that bitterest hour, the dying Christ was alone, alone in most terrible reality. 
that the supreme sacrifice of the Son might be consummated in all its fullness, the Father seems to have withdrawn the support of his immediate presence, leaving to the Savior of men the glory of complete victory over the forces of sin and death. Again, why he cries out, Why hast thou forsaken me? As the Father would completely, totally withdraw the Spirit. You need to understand, Christ had always had the presence of the Father in his life. And now he must do this alone. Elder Bruce R. McConkey stated, then the cross was raised that all might see and gape and curse and deride. This they did with vile venom for three hours from 9 a.m. to noon. Then the heavens grew black. Darkness covered the land for the space of three hours as it did among the Nephites. There was a mighty storm as though the very God of nature was in agony. And truly he was. For while he was hanging on the cross for another three hours, from noon to 3 p.m., all the infinite agonies and merciless pains of Gethsemane reoccurred. And finally, when the atoning agonies had taken their toll, when the victory had been won, when the Savior, or when the Son of God had fulfilled the will of the Father in all things, then he said, it is finished. He voluntarily gave up the ghost. Christ knows what it feels like to be lonely. As he suffers on the cross all alone in such agony. Brigham Young said the following concerning this topic. I ask, is there a reason for men and women being exposed more constantly and more powerfully to the power of the enemy by having visions than by not having them? There is, and it is simply this, God never bestows upon his people or upon an individual superior blessings without a severe trial to prove them, to prove they will keep their covenants with him and keep in remembrance what he has shown them then the greater the vision, the greater the display of the power of the enemy. And when such individuals are off their guard, they are left to themselves as Jesus was. For this express purpose, the Father withdrew his spirit from his Son at the time he was to be crucified. Jesus had been with his Father, walked with him, dwelt in his bosom, and knew all about heaven, about making the earth about the transgressions of man and what would redeem the people, and that he was the character who was to redeem the sons of earth and the earth itself from all sin that had come upon it. The light, knowledge, power, and glory with which he was clothed were far above or exceeding that of all others who have been upon the earth after the fall. Consequently, at the very moment, at the hour when the crisis came for him to offer up his life, the Father withdrew himself, withdrew his spirit, and cast a veil over him. That is what made him sweat blood. If he had had the power of God upon him, he would not have sweat blood. But all was withdrawn from him, and a veil was cast over him, and then he pleaded with the Father not to forsake him. No, says the Father, you must have your trials as well as the others. This is why Christ knows exactly what we are going through. Not just for sin, but our infirmities, our weaknesses, our afflictions. He suffered them all alone and knows how to help or succor each one of us, if, if we turn our hearts to him. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, in Oh, How Great the Plan of Our God, sorry for the typo on spelling, says the following, This withdrawal occurred in the context of a special father-son relationship, which I di digress briefly and relatively relevantly to describe 
No father had a more superb son. No son ever had a more exemplary father. In their unique majesty is an elegant meekness. In their special oneness, they are mutually differential of each other. Jesus always honored his perfect father, including by emulating his father. Thus, when during the atonement, the father withdrew his presence and his spirit, Jesus' agony was exquisitely keen. Jesus then understood personally, according to the flesh, what it is like to feel forsaken and alone, for none were with him. Even so, he gave all the glory to the Father, just as promised. He suffered willingly and voluntarily because of his loving kindness and his long-suffering towards the children of men. Such sublime and submissive character. Christ can help us with all of our firmies, inflictions, and sin. He understands being alone. He understands severe pain, either through loneliness or through sin or through afflictions. He understands all of it perfectly. When Jesus comes in overwhelming majesty and power, in at least one of his appearances, he will come in red attire, reminding us that he shed blood to atone for our sins. His voice will be heard to declare again how alone he was. I have trodden the winepress alone, and none were with me. That was finishing up Elder Maxwell. And then Elder Maxwell again now says, The more we know of Jesus' atonement, the more we will humbly and gladly glorify him, his atonement, and his character. We will never tire of paying tribute to his goodness and loving kindness. How long will we so speak of our gratitude for his atonement? The scriptures advise forever and ever. And so we should. Now, we don't talk a lot about the atonement and our Heavenly Father. There is also going on something in heaven why Christ is performing the atonement to Gethsemane, being scourged, and then crucified on a cross. I think it is wise of us to know and think what was going through the Father's mind. Could you imagine watching your beloved son suffer in agony that you and I cannot comprehend and yet doing nothing? Elder Melvin J. Ballard, grandfather of Elder Ballard in the Quorum of the Twelve, said the following concerning this idea of what was it like for Heavenly Father. His father looked on with great grief and agony over his beloved son, until there seems to have come a moment when even our Savior cried out in despair, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that hour, I think I can see our dear Father behind the veil, looking upon these dying struggles, even until even he could not endure it any longer. And like the mother who bids farewell to her dying child and has to be taken out of the room so as not to look upon the last struggles, so he, meaning the Heavenly Father, bowed his head and hid in some part of his universe, his great heart almost breaking for the love that he had for his son. Oh, in the moment when he might have saved his son, I thank him and praise him that he did not fail us. For he had not only the love of his son in mind, but he also had love for us. I rejoice that he did not interfere and that his love for us made it possible for him to endure, to look upon the suffering of his son and give him finally to us, our Savior and our Redeemer. Without him, without his sacrifice, we would have remained and we would have never 
have come glorified into his presence. And so this is what it cost, in part, for our Father in heaven to give the gift of his Son unto man. May we remember the role our Father played and how much this must have just wrung his heartstrings in agony, knowing that he could at any time save him. But he does not because of what we need to overcome the natural man. May we also worship the Father because of this and praise him forever and ever. The personal nature of the atonement. I just like to give you some quotes concerning how personal. Sometimes I think we just generally talk about, yes, the atonement. He suffered for the sins of mankind, their afflictions, yeah. And we just generally talk about this thing that as a group he did for us. But look what Elder Merrill J. Bateman of the Quorum of Seventy said. In the garden and on the cross, Jesus saw each of us and not only bore our sins, but also experienced our deepest feelings so that he would know how to comfort and strengthen us. The Savior, as a member of the Godhead, knows each of us personally. Isaiah and the prophet of Benedi said that when Christ would make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Abinadi explains that his seed are the righteous, those who follow the prophets. In the garden and on the cross, Jesus saw each of us and not only bore our sins, but also experienced our deepest feelings so that he would know how to comfort and strengthen us. And then another occasion, he said, the Savior's atonement in the garden and on the cross is intimate as well as infinite. Infinite in that it spans the eternities. Intimate that the Savior felt each person's pains, suffering, and sicknesses. Consequently, he knows how to carry our sorrows and relieve our burdens that we might be healed from within, made whole persons and receive everlasting joy in his kingdom in some way that is just at least incomprehensible to me Christ saw and felt our pains personally not just generally but personally for every person what they would be afflicted with no wonder we sing how great thou art Again, Elder Bateman says, Alma reveals to us the process by which the Master learned perfect empathy in the flesh. He experienced not only our sins, but also our pains, sufferings, temptations of every kind, sicknesses, infirmities, and weaknesses. He also experienced death in order to loose the bands of death for his people. Consequently, if one of us has a special problem, it is not possible for him or her to say, no one knows what I am experiencing. No one understands my pain or suffering. The Lord knows. He not only knows the depth of your experience, he knows how to succor you because of his suffering. I testify that he knows each of us, is concerned about our progress, and has the infinite capacity not only to heal our wounds, but also lift us up to the Father as sanctified sons and daughters. What a great principle. What a great do doctrine. We are never alone in our suffering. Christ understands specifically and deeply all of our afflictions and sufferings. C.S. Lewis, the great Christian writer, said, God is not hurried along in the time stream of this universe any more than an author is hurried along in the imaginary time of his own novel. He has infinite attention to spare for each one of us. He does not have to deal with us in the mass. 
you are as much alone with him as if you were the only being he had ever created. When Christ died, he died for you individually, just as much as if you had been the only man in the world. Again, no wonder we sing, I stand all amazed at the love Jesus offers me. This personal nature of the atonement is for each of us. The atonement and ingratitude. Here's what President Joseph Fielding Smith said that we may want to be cautious about. One of the greatest sins, both in magnitude and extent, for it enters into the lives of every one of us without exception to some degree, is the sin of ingratitude. When we violate a commandment, no matter how small and insignificant, we may think it to be, we show our ingratitude to our Redeemer. It is impossible for us to comprehend the extent of his suffering when he carried the burden of the sins of the whole world, a punishment so severe that we informed that blood came from the pores of his body, and this was before he was taken to the cross. The punishment of physical pain coming from the nails driven in his hands and feet was not the greatest of his suffering, excruciating as that surely was. The greatest suffering was the spiritual and mental anguish coming from the load of our transgressions which he carried. If we understand the extent of that suffering and his suffering on the cross, surely none of us would willfully be guiltful, guilty of sin. We would not give way to the temptations, the gratification of unholy appetites and desires, and Satan could find no place in our hearts. As it is, whenever we sin, we show our ingratitude and disregard for the suffering of the Son of God, by and through which we shall rise from the dead and live forever. If we really understand and could feel, even to a small degree, the love and gracious willingness on the part of Jesus Christ to suffer for our sins, we would be willing to repent of all our transgressions and serve him. Isn't it interesting that once a week we have an opportunity to apply this principle? To try to understand and feel to the smallest degree what Christ has done for us, the love that he has shed for us, and our willingness to remember him and keep his commandments. In Luke 23, verses 39 through 43, we see another one of Christ's characteristics. Starting with verse 39, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed, ra railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation. Verse 41, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise, meaning the world of spirits. Thus, in the severe agony, the Savior is able to look outward to teach the thief on the cross. I don't know about you, but whenever I am going through afflictions and sorrows and sickness and suffering, I turn inward and worry about me and what's happening to me. Christ going through suffering that is beyond our comprehension turns outward and teach us one of the things on the cross. That is great character. In John 19, 25 through 27, we see again 
Christ character of not turning inward and focusing on his suffering, but looking outward to help another. Verse 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, which would be John, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Again, in suffering incomprehensible to us, Christ looks down in the midst of this personal agony and sees his mother and is worried. I'm not going to be here anymore. And he's worried for her welfare. Why, he's suffering. He is more worried about his mother and asked John to take care of her. What great character of compassion Christ displays in the moment of, some, of his severest suffering. Christ is still able to look outward and help others. Perhaps we too could try and look outward and bless others even in our moments of suffering. John chapter 19 verses 10 through 11 shows that Christ is in control of all that's going on. Starting with verse 10, it says, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? As Christ will not answer Pilate in some of the things he asks, Pilate then threatens him, Don't you know I have power to save your life, or to have you crucified? Listen to Christ's response. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Christ says, No, I am in complete troll. I have power from heaven, and I could stop all of this in an instant. Christ had the ability to stop it all and to then just walk away from the suffering. But because of his integrity and his character, he fulfills his preparations unto men. Thus we see another character of Christ in that he could have stopped all that was happening to him, but instead did the will of the Father in carrying out the full measure of the atonement. In other words, he's saying, Pilate, I am letting you do this to me. Christ is in complete control. How submissive am I to the will of the Father versus my own will? Can I submit the way I want things done to the way Christ and the Father want things done. Can I submit my will to theirs? Is one of the great tests of our character here on earth. Well, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.